Hey podcast, this is Robert. Uh, before we get into today's show, for those of you who are looking for jobs right now or are fresh from getting their certification in design sprints, I'm going to be holding an event in August that is going to basically be a pilot for the Global Virtual Design Sprint. It's uh, the first talent sprint I'll be doing. If you're interested in getting involved or learning more information or wanting to know more, uh, reach out to me at robert at dallasdesignsprints.com and we can have a conversation. All right. Thanks a lot. Welcome one and all to the Dallas Design Sprints podcast. My name is Robert Scrobe, and on today's show, we're featuring Ross Chapman. He is a design sprint facilitator, a remote coach, and a product design leader hailing from London. I'm a big fan of Ross. I have been following and listening to his material. I don't know, listen. I think I've been watching his material, but he's somebody that early on, I just had a feeling about that he had a unique point of view. He was really driven to kind of put design sprints on the map with etched sprints. And uh, I really enjoyed my conversation with him. We explored a lot of different aspects of his background in UX and where he's taking his business currently. Um, I wish him all the best. I really hope he succeeds. But for your entertainment and for your information, here is Ross and I's uh, conversation that we had. Hope you enjoy it, and we'll see you in a little bit. So, Ross, thank you very much for coming on the show. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, me too. Fantastic. So, currently, right now, you are part of Etch Sprints. You're the head of Etch Sprints, in fact, and this has been going on for about a little over six months, based out of uh, London, the United Kingdom. Now, what's interesting about this particular company is, is that it exists within an agency. Can you kind of explain that a bit? Edge Sprints is a team of uh, myself uh, at the moment, seeing as we started in October. And Edge Group is essentially a group of teams. It's not like an agency that has big hierarchy, looks like a big triangle uh, with kind of many levels of management and people getting in the way. Really, Edge Group is about lots of different teams because we believe small teams make a big difference. And after trialing the sprint out for around about a year, I, I came back to the, the group after going on holiday and reading sprint for the first time uh, and started running sprints, did, you know, probably about 35 or so and said, I think we're on to something here. I think we've had enough reps of it. I think we understand it. And I think we need to stop half asking it and really focus on providing sprints for groups of companies and also maybe training people uh, because it seems to be something valuable. So we did that in October. And since then, I've been running sprints. I've been uh, training people and building this awareness of what it is, what it's good for, what it's not so good for, and really trying to understand myself where the value can be uh, within each team's problem, within each large company or small, to uh, really deliver the best value that I can. So when you present and teach design sprints, what have you been noticing from your audience and from those that you're teaching? How are they taking the methodology and do you see it being adopted? The interesting thing about training is that I set out in October to thinking that training would probably be 20% of what we do. The, the rest will be just facilitation. But training has an interesting uh, kind of route because... It's, it's not only just uh, teams within big companies saying we need a better way of working or we keep on talking about this but not getting any further. It's also the agencies and consultants that are saying, hey, this might be a, a new method I could use when I'm consulting or doing my thing with, with other companies. So... It's really been a wide range of people coming to training. We've had uh, 
uh, individual consultants. We've had teams from uh, product design uh, backgrounds. We've had a few scrum masters, and that was uh, a fantastic kind of opportunity because they're essentially coaches of teams. They were looking at evaluating what the design sprint could offer, and uh, it was fantastic to kind of see what they were experiencing, but also answer their questions. And those questions were more like, how does sprints fit in with agile and uh, those kind of things. But we've also had some product designers and it is quite a wide church uh, for people that want to learn this way. And we're, we're still learning what our value is in this space because there's many ways of learning how to run design sprints. Uh, we're just trying to figure out through doing. So we've done maybe four or so public design sprints. We've done uh, five internal. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that I'm still experimenting with. And I think we, we've nearly found our flow with it. When comparing your company and what you do with other offerings in the market, kind of continuing on that thought, what distinguishes your organization and what you do compared to where, what other people could choose? I think the main unique thing about training with Edge Sprints is the people. <laughs> it's, it's really myself and, and my experience that I, I'm bringing to it, my perspective. And I guess some of that is really honed to digital products and how you can use design sprints to start your next uh, feature update or a new product or app uh, or service. So I guess that's where the value is. We started doing training because we found it to be a good thing to do after you've read Sprint and maybe you've tried your first one, but you just need a bit more kind of practice, a few more reps of it. And it's kind of a, a safe environment to do that. So knowing that people would go from the book or maybe a few YouTube videos and want some practical experience. Uh, we started running uh, training events in London and uh, yeah, we've had a few people th through our doors and I think just trying out the most difficult exercises, uh, having your questions answered uh, by someone that does it day in day out. I think there was something useful there, which uh, some people have, have signed up to and gone through. You had mentioned people being the differentiator for Etch Sprints. Can you introduce anyone on your team in particular that you'd like to showcase that distinguishes that statement about Etch Sprints having some really good people on staff? Yeah, well, it's really just me right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's all about people then. I got it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> blow my own trumpet. But really, what else is there to, to compare about? I mean, I, I, th I think what's useful to say right now is I learned the five-day design sprint from Jake Knapp. I went to one of his workshops in Copenhagen, had a fantastic experience there, and that really got me onto the sprint track. Since learning that, I opened YouTube and learned about the Design Sprint 2.0. And after looking at that, also understanding how to start doing sprints within Etch, and we actually finished at three o'clock on a Friday. And uh, to start doing the Design Sprints, Friday was my catch-up day. So running the four-day Design Sprint was something that really appealed, and that's how we started running sprints. I would say I, I find it to be a fantastic methodology and I like that flavor of design sprint. And what I, what I do like is other people are finding nuances or improvements. And even through talking with Jake when, when I met him last year, uh, he would say, just keep experimenting, keep trying new things. You know, it, it, it's not a, a thing that stops with, with him. Uh, you've got to try these these new kind of hacks or improvements and uh, and just have fun with it. To that point, how are you experimenting with the design sprint process going forward? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think over the last few months, I've been listening and I'm nearly about to start experimenting. So there are some 
there are some parts of the design sprint which I get questioned quite a bit nearly in every sprint that I do. So one of those things is open voting. So you you start voting up solutions or you start voting up uh, a part of a, a user journey uh, or anything where we use voting to decide. You're more often than not going to be influenced by someone that votes before you. So how might we, in, in a classic problem framing term, how might we improve that and and make it a little less influenced by your peers? There are other parts as well. I always think lightning demos could do with a bit of a tech upgrade. So whenever I ask teams to do lightning demos, we go around the table and more often than not, they're not showing the, the thing that they want to demonstrate on their uh, laptop or on their phone. It, and it's quite hard for a team to kind of peer in and see that. So I'd like to experiment there. And then I think the final one is when it comes to sketching, one of the comments that I keep on hearing, and it comes up time and time again, is that there's a feeling that the best sketches win or the best sketches communicate what they want to, to kind of put forward. And I've been listening to that, and no matter how often you consistently put out, you know, thick markers and yellow post-its, uh, some people break away, or then they're kind of designing it in a way that, that looks better than their peers. So how might we ensure that sketching and the 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 kind of practical use of sketching uh, is, is as even or as kind of uh, consistent as, as possible. So there, there's kind of three areas that I'd like to experiment with. And uh, personally, it's, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really like creating anything. Like I, I'm, I'm, I like problem solving. My, my value is kind of, even with the sprint, I read the sprint book, I said, that is, is something that I didn't have before. I'm going to take that and I'm going to run with it. But creating like these hacks or, or something new, I, I, yeah, it takes me a bit longer. <laughs> but why, why is that? Do you think? I think, I think I haven't had enough reps of creating. I think, uh, you know, when, when, ever you invent something, uh, you know, I, I should probably run a few sprints for myself, really, you know, <laughs> do, do a lightning demo and, uh, you know, put together a solution sketch and, uh, and kind of put it through that because that, that would probably be useful for me. But yeah, creating stuff. And this is where I'm not sure I'm a designer anymore. <laughs> I, I kind of, I like the, the power of the team. I like people like filling the framework. I, I like my, my own value in getting them to um, work together, align on problems, align on solutions, and they fill it with, with their expertise and what they're great at. Uh, I, I kind of like the reps. Uh, so when it, I'm asked to create something, yeah, I kind of, yeah, might, might procrastinate on that a bit. What's interesting about that statement is you come from a background of user experience and design. So when I hear you say that you're not really into creating, I don't consider it to be you know, bad, but it begs the question, since you come from a UX design background, what kind of led you into product design and design sprints? How has that evolution happened? Yeah, I'll, I'll try and give you a whistle-stop tour because I, I think it's important to kind of outline where it came from for me and it might reinforce that kind of uh, problem-solving aspect of myself. So I I never had formal training in design at all. I, I did a, a media with cultural studies degree. But all the while at university and maybe before, I was investigating this new thing that was getting a bit more mainstream called the internet. And what I liked is that I, I was creating stuff. So th this is where I would uh, start with uh, Microsoft front page. I think I, I moved on to Dreamweaver and then realized the rubbish it was spitting out. 
uh, and then started learning kind of coding and how to design stuff. And I did that for a few years. I, I would create websites. Uh, I found a way to get paid for it so I could somehow value my, my service. And uh, it, was, it was an exciting journey for me. And this was web design. This was kind of designing stuff in Photoshop, slicing it up, and uh, trying to put it on the web. And the, the problem that I found, and it, it came with a few projects, was things were taking longer than normal. And the clients would ask me to change things and adjust things based on what they wanted to see with their investment into a website. And I kept on questioning, why, why is this kind of up for discussion? And then why is it so subjective? And upon understanding that question, I found this thing called user experience design. And UX design for me started giving me the answers to what makes a great design. So I was understanding, oh, we have to test with the people that's going to use this thing. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Let's try that. Uh, we have to look at layouts and understand how people use things. And so I quite quickly got into the world of UX design. Uh, book reading isn't my strong suit. Google is my friend. So I would Google everything. And I, I actually want to, at some point, make a video on how to use Google because I think more people need to know. And I, that's a serious point. I really think that it's, it's a free way of learning. It's all out there. You just have to find it. And I started learning all these techniques and, you know, understanding that you only need to test with five people because that's what Nielsen Norman Group said. So that's great. I'm going to move on with that. And then a few other things about heuristics and things. So moving on from there, I, I kind of self-learned how to do UX design. And uh, the, the job I had at the time, I was, I think, a digital designer. I kind of put it to them that I like this thing. I'm, I want to do more of it. So I said, can I, I want to be a UX designer. Or said, I probably said, can I be a UX designer? And they said, uh, that's great, Ross. Um, seeing as you're going to lead this, we're going to put lead on the end of your title. So I quickly went from digital designer to UX design lead or um, user experience lead and uh, was able to do more of what I loved, which was kind of finding these answers to the subjectivity that I had in design. And if anything, shorten the time in delivering stuff by saying, here's an idea, let's test it. Here's an idea, let's test it. And it, it's this lovely kind of iterative cycle of experimenting and learning. And that's really where I started on the kind of UX design area and did that for a few years, learned quite a lot, learned more about how businesses design and how they make decisions and uh, quickly got to a point where I picked up the sprint book and uh, my world changed. And that's an interesting jump point to the business aspect of design sprints. How has that influenced your approach to the methodology and how you approach it with clients? Yeah, so I, I'm in a kind of agency setting. So we will work with teams as a kind of outsourcer, uh, but we, we don't see it like that. And I know often agencies will say that, but it really isn't the case when we're working with teams. It, it's, it's a it's an outcome from the team, whether that's two people from Etch and, and the rest from, from the client. I, I acknowledge that teams find it hard to make decisions. They just do. And I, I will write a paper or, or, or do something kind of practical with this. But I have the feeling that when people leave school and they go to, to work, they learn off their co-workers and they learn off their line managers and they rarely question how things are done. And throughout when I was kind of client side, when, when I was working on products and teams, where I was getting the most success was ignoring all of that. So where I would try something new, where I, I read a Medium article and then tried it, whether it was card sorting or uh, expert interviews or 
um, testing out in the field. When I was trying new things, things were changing and things were moving on. So when I'm in this role as I am now, where I'm facilitating teams and and trying to get them to make decisions uh, in a safe environment, uh, I've, I see this hesitation because there, there's job security in question. You know, I, I, I shouldn't take risks because I want to keep my job. Over time, and I guess the more seasoned people will see this, that if you don't take risks, then you'll be out of a job. And I, <laughs> I just see some of this resistance early on and try and just make a safe environment to fail because people don't like failure. It looks bad uh, from their perspective. And I, th- I think it's taking a lot longer for companies to get used to that idea that they do have to experiment. They can't just copy what Amazon do because they don't know why they've done it. And they have to have this culture of experimenting, but not in an innovation lab, siloed away, not somewhere where you buy a document that tells you your strategy and then you kind of save it and put it up on the shelf. These things are something that the whole team, the core team need to do. And and from that, I just see that we all need to learn more. We need to learn more about what other people are doing and why. We need to learn more about failing fast and... uh, kind of iterating and experimenting because change is the constant now. We, we have to change. So that, that's the thing I'm getting from teams when I start working with them. And your career has been a testament to that approach of essentially moving forward, experimenting, trying new things, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't, but really consistently moving forward. Yeah, I mean, if you mean why have I changed jobs so quickly over time, it is exactly like like that, Robert. It's I have I have learned what I need to learn. I've tried a few things, and maybe after a time, I need a new challenge. And that's why my history looks like I've been in a job role for a year, maybe a year and a half, and then I move on to the next challenge. What that taught me was over, you know, four or five years is that I personally need variation and, 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 and learning new things. And the best place for me to do that is in an agency setting. And even if I wasn't in an agency now, having something like the sprint where it's time boxed, we have a set time and each week's going to be different. That that is my my sweet spot. I love I love that. I love kind of the the speed of action. I like having a fake deadline. I like that you. I'm not asking for more time, uh, which is quite different to designers that I meet and talk to. They want you know multi month projects. They want to immerse themselves. They want to do all this understanding and research and spend times making libraries and things. And personally, that is just not for me. I like action. I like launching. I like learning. Uh, so, yeah, my my kind of career has been uh, a a kind of a case study of learning in a very strange way by just changing jobs. <laughs> I I found examples where oh, we need to hire someone. Uh, let's just kind of shake off that job description and put it live and. I think there's a big distinction between people that care about what they do and people that just go to work. And I've certainly found over the last few years, I found what I really enjoy, my purpose, and, and found a subject matter that I care about. And I think people are still on that journey. And it's not defined by how old you are, how much experience you have. Uh, I think at some certain point, everything just clicks or sometimes it doesn't for some people. Uh, and you just find what you are destined to do. And if you haven't found that, then you just need to keep on trying new things because I, I get asked by students and maybe, uh, designers or others that have been in the industry a while and now they're going, well, what's next? And, you know, what, what, and also the world's changing. We don't have 
UX designers seem to be less popular than product designers now. What does that even mean? So, yeah, I, I think everything is changing at a much faster rate than it's ever been. And it's all thanks to the internet. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's how I've experienced it, I guess. And we're both fans of Gary Vaynerchuk's approach about putting the effort in, experimenting, seeing what works. And it's to your point, you really have to get out there and figure out what is going to seem to make sense to the market you're serving and to the audience that you're producing content for, which is actually bridges into my next question is content creation. Are you planning on writing in medium or producing videos or going some in a particular direction to teach or showcase the, some of those ideas you have about the design sprint process that you'd like to explore? If I was putting together some, some new hacks or uh, something that I think would be valuable to people, the first instinct, and it's something that Gary Vaynerchuk would say, is, is play to your strengths. Do, do something that's natural to you or, or that the, is your kind of sweet spot. And so in my realm, that would probably be a number of Instagram stories, uh, maybe a medium post because I can crank those out pretty quickly. Uh, and, and maybe, you know, some other kind of post, maybe a webinar. I don't know. The thing is that that's something that I would do and feels natural. The thing is, I recognize that the marketplace is often different to what I think. Uh, and I'm a unique person. I think a learning avenue is YouTube. And I think that's where people search in what they want to learn. And that's where they get the, the output from it. The, the problem I've had with YouTube is <laughs> I'm a ex, uh, video editor. Uh, my kind of start in life was editing videos, sometimes creating videos. And so I've been a bit obsessed about the quality and as you know, YouTube is kind of an evergreen place. You put it in there and it stays on, on you know, on, until someone decides to take it down or, or um, you're just so ashamed of what you put up, you delete it. And that's why I haven't really been doing YouTube content at all. It's also incredibly difficult to do something of quality uh, by yourself. And I've got a very kind of old DSLR, which I can't really see what I'm shooting and kind of guess whether it's in focus or not. So it, it's, it's this weird kind of uh, difference in me in that I do care about getting stuff out there, um, learning from it, uh, iterating, improving. But when it comes to YouTube, it's just been kind of blindsided by my obsession with perfection, which is something that I don't attest to in any other part of my work. I mean, my, my keynote slides are probably the messiest any designer's ever done. Uh, some of my emails are kind of drastically short of what they should be. I mean, if you ever looked at what Steve Jobs would reply to, you know, kind of two word answers in an email. Uh, I, I've been sometimes kind of, uh, I get this feedback that, oh no, you need to explain it a bit more. And I'm like, well, I, I try to like being punchy and get the message across in as few uh, syllables as possible. But yeah, so I'd, I'd love to share on YouTube. It's just been a bit of a, uh, a sore subject with me. I have filmed so much stuff and it's never seen the light of day just because I've obsessed about how it looks and how it sounds and how I communicate it on YouTube. And it is an art, my words. I mean, people that do it are very, very good at it. You and I say that knowing that you're going to do YouTube's content soon as well. Oh, <laughs> so. Like you, like you would not believe. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> say a couple of things. First is, um, you know too much probably, because you've yes. been doing video editing for a while and you've seen high quality content being produced and the reaction to it and what kind of attention it garners. I used to have that approach and I've changed recently, and the reason why I've changed and the reason I'm I'm giving you this perspective is that I'm also very embarrassed by some of the early videos I put out, which were in my home's media room with a couple of uh, like a, a floodlight and a key light shining down on me. And basically me 
taking the highlights and the top points from a, uh, say a LinkedIn article that I wrote and conveying them through, through speech. And I did those just to experiment and I can't for the life of me go back and look at them because I just don't like seeing myself talk on video. Yeah. Conversely though, other people don't have that bias. And I heard last week when we were registering people online for, the, for this upcoming event I'm doing, I heard from someone that was a designer in a company saying, oh yeah, my CEO knows who you are based on those videos. And it floored me, not because mm. I was chuffed, but I, because I was shocked in that, okay, what kind of impression does this person have of me? But apparently it was positive to the point where this designer wanted to leverage who I was to get in good with his boss. It was the strangest thing. But it also said, you know what, if I'm going to be making a lot of videos, educational material for the audience that I'm going to be serving soon in the next month, I don't think they're going to have those same uh, hangups that I do about my content. Now, I'm not going to sit there and walk around with a jiggly iPhone and make videos. I'm going to give it some level of quality, but it's to the it's it maybe it's like the tenant of the sprint book. You get Goldilocks quality, just yeah. enough to be believable, but no one else has to see all the garbage that my six year old is leaving all over the house. I can basically <laughs> make sure that I get the content out, have the message convey it in a way that makes sense. And if it suits the purpose of what the video is supposed to do, then it's okay. Then I can reflect back on how gray my hair was or at a later date, you know, you know, nudge myself for how I skipped over a few syllables. But I guess through that entire explanation, I'm saying, you know, go easy on yourself. Maybe it's just more to the point of experimentation. I thought the recent video you put up of yourself on LinkedIn was fine. I didn't have any negative connotation towards you or your brand or who you were because of it. I just thought that you were trying out video and conveying a message and that was enough. And if I didn't like it, I could just go, well, there's more on my feed. I'll do the eight seconds of scanning and then go to the next one, depending on how much time I had. But I'd still like to see more. And especially since I've, I've seen your articles, seen your recent material, I'd like to see where you go. And if, if I could give you a vote of confidence, I think you have a unique perspective and I think you have a voice and you should start exercising it. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Thank you, Robert. I mean, yeah, LinkedIn is, is different for me because I, I, I'm not obsessing about that. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm happy with just stuff that looks kind of quick and, if I've got an idea or something to communicate, I, I just whip out the phone and now it's, it's easy to record within that. Uh, but yeah, YouTube has always been my sore, <laughs> my sore spot. What I have found with, with creating content and kind of the second part of the, your question was that the more I'm doing it, the more I'm getting back. And it's not just in, I don't really care about likes and um, claps or follows it's the comments that I get back or the, the DMs or the messages or anything like that. That is what Gary Vaynerchuk would say would be my oxygen. Um, the, the kind of the vanity metrics of it, I don't really care about because if anything, these are my experiments and I'm getting more reps. And one of my kind of truths has been that I've always, I've wanted to be in pursuit of relevancy. I want to be relevant. I want to be the kind of understanding where things are right now. I don't really want to look into the future and say, well, I need to obsess about this new technology. I want to be as relevant as I can to the people that are going to kind of get some benefit from that. But yeah, I, I find LinkedIn easier. <laughs> and it speaks to the tenets of the network economy, which you and I had talked about before we started recording, but you never really know where things are going. But as long as you get to know people, respond to comments, start those conversations, even initiate conversations, whether they're on Instagram or LinkedIn or on Medium, but starting that conversation to not only understand one another, but to get that perspective that you need. Yeah. And there, there was a comment um, or some kind of quote that I liked was uh, someone would des describe competition. And uh, they, they were saying something, uh, it was kind of in a, a graphic, 
And the end point was um, something around competition. And in my perspective is I want us all to make it. And that's what I like. I, I want us all to succeed or, or learn new stuff or, or try and, you know, break our, our boundaries, um, get uncomfortable uh, and get out of our comfort zones. I, I think there's enough to go around. And uh, that's why I haven't created the kind of Ross Chapman version of the sprint or um, called the lightning decision jam something else or um, anything like that because I, I, don't, I don't feel like I need to own anything. I just want to be the best practitioner that I can at it. And uh, I'm not going to write a book anytime soon. Writing is not my forte. Um, and I don't know what I'd write about right now. So that's, that's what I like. I like the network economy. I want to work with teams. I, I work with agencies. And sometimes when they reach out to me, either for training or we kind of run a sprint together, uh, they're quite tentative to, to start with. They're like, you know, I, I don't know how you feel about this, but, you know, I, I'm an agency. It would be great to kind of meet up and talk and, you know, have a coffee. I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, if anything, if, if whatever I say and you feed back on it, then I'm learning too. So my, my metric isn't to, to build the biggest kind of building in, in the city. It's to kind of learn as much as I can uh, and if anything, share that when I've, I've got enough to, to give. And you'll eventually find out where it all leads to. It's, it'll be one of those things where it'll, by, by virtue of your actions or the different places you go, you'll eventually stumble upon or something will present to you, uh, either an opportunity or a perspective or something that makes you pause and go, well, wait a minute, what about this? Just like Design Sprints did a while back, there could be something that comes up in the near future where it does the exact same thing and you just follow it to see where it goes. Yeah, this is the wonderful thing about um, doing what I'm doing. I don't, I don't have an end plan. I don't have an end game. I don't have the next thing to kind of shoot for. And, uh, you know, it's not all figured out. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm running sprints right now because I think they're valuable and I like it. And that's... That's, that's something that I know. I've been told recently to maybe calm down on sharing the special source. <laughs> maybe you're giving a bit too much away. And I'll only find that in, you know, in, in the long term, whether that's, that's a deal breaker or not. Um, but something, I guess, as a designer, if, if I am that, uh, that I've learned is that <laughs> you've just got to be really human about stuff. And, uh, you know, I don't have it all figured out. I'm going to find out. But for me, success is a journey. If people want to find out more about you and what you're up to, where should they go online to look for that? I'm pretty much on Instagram quite a bit. So finding me at Ross Chapman is, I kind of use that as my, it's a bit like my counseling chamber. I, I kind of, vocalize my thoughts or uh you know what i'm working on and those kind of things i hit up medium a bit now and again and uh yeah a bit of linkedin activity um but really i'm spending a lot more time on building a design sprint business which not a lot of people kind of would see because when, when you're working on something or you're running a sprint, it's quite hard to document as you're going through and Edge Sprints is a team of one right now. So uh, that, that's, that's really where you'll find me. Um, and I'm always happy to you know, grab a virtual coffee or chat to anyone because you know, I'm learning too. All right, Ross. Thank you very much for the conversation. Enjoy the rest of your week and we'll talk later. Thanks, Robert. It's been a blast. Thank you very much for tuning in to the Dallas Design Sprints podcast. If you have a question or a comment, feel free to leave those at robert at dallasdesignsprints.com. You can also find me all over the web. I'm on Pinterest, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and probably a couple of other ones I'm forgetting. If you have the time to do so, please leave a comment on iTunes or give me a rating that is worthy of what you think of the podcast. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you next time.